Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Moose Henderson. I'm a wildlife photographer. Today we're going to talk about techniques for the beginning wildlife photographer. Now these are techniques that you can use to be able to jump start your learning process and even if you're a more experienced wildlife photographer and you feel like you're kind of stagnated these techniques will be of help to you also. So we'll do that right after this. video about a week or so ago in which I described some basic equipment for a beginning wildlife photographer and I'll link that up here in the corner if you haven't seen that and so this video assumes that you've gotten that equipment you've got yourself a digital camera probably a crop sensor camera you've gotten yourself a telephoto lens either a zoom lens like from 100 to 400 millimeters or maybe you've gotten yourself a prime lens like a 400 f 5.6 or something like that but you've gotten yourself a fairly good telephoto lens to be able to do wildlife photography with. So what is the next thing that you need to do? Well what you really need is practice and practice is kind of an active word. If you talk to an athlete Say you talk to someone who's a quarterback for football, practice to them means going out and throwing the football to people doing certain routes and things like that. Practice to a basketball player means actually working in concert with other people to be able to shoot baskets and stuff. A practice in photography is also an active thing. Of course, you can just go out and snap pictures and call that practice, but I tend to think of practice as being more of an active verb. This is something that you're going out with the intention of getting better. And so in this video, that's the context that we're going to use this word practice, is going out with the intention of getting better every time that you're exercising your craft of wildlife photography. So the first thing that we're going to need is a subject to photograph and I would suggest that you pick a cooperative subject. If you're a mammal photographer that subject may be a gray squirrel or if you happen to live in a place where there's prairie dogs all around that would be a good choice. If you're someone who likes reptiles or something, maybe a turtle would be a good choice or an alligator would be a good choice. Uh, if you're someone who wants to be a bird photographer, then a bird would be a good choice. Something in the medium size bird range. You don't want to pick something like a really tiny bird, like a warbler or a chickadee or something, because then you get the complication of enlarging them large enough on your screen and on your sensor to be able to come back with good images. Now you want this subject to be of neutral tone like kind of a gray or tan or brownish color type of animal. If you're photographing birds you do not want to pick an all white bird like a snowy owl or an all black bird like a grackle because that enters new complications and we're just getting started with our learning process in wildlife photography here so we need to pick an animal that's kind of neutral tone and shown here on the screen is a gray squirrel and also shown on the screen here is a prairie dog and you can see that both of these animals are kind of neutral tone 
and that will give us a good experience base to be able to build our learning upon. The next thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to shoot at all different times of the day. Go out and photograph this subject. Let's say you've chosen to photograph a prairie dog. So go out in the early morning to photograph this prairie dog. Go out in the midday. Go out in the late afternoon and go out at dusk and photograph this prairie dog. And what you're doing by going out at these various times, you're training your eye to be able to see the difference in lighting, to be able to see the harshness of the midday light as opposed to the early morning light. You're also training your eye to be able to see the subtle changes in color from the early morning light, from a very soft light in the early morning, to photograph this chosen subject from many different light angles. I want you to photograph it with the light coming directly over your shoulder, what one famous bird photographer calls pointing your shadow at the bird. I'm not a big fan of that particular type of photography because I think that gives you a very flat light. I tend to like the sun angle to be about 15 degrees on either my left or my right. As my mentor would say, light illuminates, shadows define. So shadows are not bad. You do want some shadows. And with the light just a little bit off at an angle, it's coming across the animal or the bird and you're getting detail between the fur. You're getting detail between the individual feathers because you'll get a very faint shadow between each of the feathers and this gives you that light illuminates and shadows define characteristic. Now as you shoot early in the morning and late in the day the light is much softer and the shadows are much softer and by shooting at all of these different times throughout the day you're able to train your eye as to what times of the day work best by shooting with the light at various light angles, say the light over your shoulder, the light from 15 degrees, maybe you're shooting with the light side light or doing backlight. All of those is very important for you to learn how to be able to manage those light angles. When the light is back behind, you're generally going to get a silhouetted image. But not only work with the silhouette, Start adjusting your exposure so you can get some detail in your subject, even when the sun is directly behind. Learn what you have to do, what type of changes you have to make to your shutter speed, to your aperture, to your ISO, to be able to come back with the effect that you want to control. Always remember, the camera is nothing more than a tool. It is your job to come back with the image that you have in mind. Don't let your camera dictate what image you should take home. You should dictate what image you take home. And if you want a subject to be backlit, but still to be able to see detail, then you need to be able to choose the shutter speed, the ISO, and the aperture that is adequate to be able to come back with that expression. And by doing this experiment, this practice, you're teaching yourself how to do that. Now you're not trying to come back with prize winning images here, but you are trying to come home with stuff that you're proud of. And by going out and shooting the same animal day after day after day in different lighting scenarios, you'll be training yourself how to come back with the images that you have in mind. When you go home at the end of the day and you upload the images on your computer and you look at them and you go, gee, 30% of my images are too dark, 30% of my images are too light, and 30% of my images are well exposed. What am I doing wrong? and use that as a training exercise 
to be able to learn how to set your exposure. I always use manual exposure. A lot of people use an automated mode, such as shutter priority or aperture priority or program mode. I like to be able to tell my camera what I want it to do. I don't want the camera telling me what I want to do. So I usually shoot on manual exposure mode and I pick my, my settings for my exposure meter very carefully, usually by metering off a neutral tone subject, such as brown grass or hay or something like that. At the end of the day, when you go through your pictures and critically look at these pictures, look critically at the exposures, look critically at the focus. Is the focus point where you want it to be? Is the animal lit the way you want it to be lit? And if it's not, think to yourself, what can I do differently to come home tomorrow with the image I have in mind? not the image the camera wants me to come home with. And so what are these images? What are some of the images that you should come home with? Let's take a look at a sample shooting scenario of what you can go out and shoot with this one single animal day after day after day. Well, when you go out to photograph an animal, you want to take a portrait. Now this portrait can either be a horizontal or a vertical. And usually with a small animal, a portrait is going to be the entire animal. It's not going to be like a human where it's just the face, unless you have a really long lens or a really cooperative animal that will allow you to just photograph their face. So you're going to take a portrait which just puts the animal in its environment and you're photographing basically the animal. The animal's going to be the star of the frame. It's going to be occupying the majority of the picture. And if your animal is going side to side like this, then you want probably a horizontal image. If the animal is standing straight up and down, then you probably want to shoot a vertical image. It's important if you're ever going to sell your photos that you shoot both horizontal and vertical images. Publishers always want a choice as to whether the image is horizontal or vertical. And don't just shoot vertical for no good reason or horizontal for no good reason. Let the orientation of the animal dictate whether you're shooting vertical or horizontal. If the animal is running along the ground, that's probably a horizontal. If the animal is going up the side of a tree or coming down the side of a tree, that's probably a vertical. And so think about those things while you're holding your camera. Should I be holding it horizontal or should I be holding it vertical? And always train yourself to take both horizontals and verticals. So after you've gotten a horizontal and a vertical of your animal, bird, or whatever you've chosen to photograph, what is the next thing that you want to do? Well, you want to get some action shots of them. You want to get some shots of them feeding on various things. And remember, you want these in both horizontal and vertical. You want to get some shots of them running, some shots of them doing various activities that that animal typically does. Say you're photographing a prairie dog. Well, prairie dogs very often call to their neighbors and tell them what's going on. And they'll stand up on their hind legs and call, or they'll sit outside their burrows and call. They'll also flick their tails as they call, and you'll see their tail coming up like this. Well, that's a behavioral shot. Take a photo of that. You may have to take a number of images to get it just at the right angle that you want it at, but that's part of your job is to be watching what the animal is doing. And if you photograph the same animal day after day after day, you get much better at predicting what that animal is going to do the next time you photograph it. 
Like for instance, one time we saw a grizzly bear in Grand Teton National Park. And we saw him going over and up the side of a mountain and stuff. And we knew that he was going to cross this mountain. Well, I got in my car and I drove around to a specific place and then stopped and waited there. And maybe 40 minutes later, the grizzly comes over the top of the hill, right down the mountain, right down the side of the path, and right down in front of my car. And some people who had come well after the grizzly had gone through there asked me, Moose, how did you know the grizzly bear was going to walk right here? And it's because I had been there hundreds and hundreds of times and watched what that animal had done. Animals are creatures of habit, just like humans. They're generally going to walk the same path, the same direction, the same routine, day after day after day unless there's something that causes them to want to change that routine. Okay, so we photographed the animal doing some feeding. We we photographed some of their actions and stuff. Uh, they're jumping, they're running up and down the tree, they're calling to their neighbors. What else do we want to photograph? We want to photograph family interactions. Don't just photograph one animal, maybe photograph two animals. Now, of course, two animals is going to be more challenging, but your training to become a wildlife photographer, accept these challenges, embrace them. Two animals, you may need a greater depth of focus so that both animals are in focus at one time. Maybe there's three animals. Now you've really got to use your head and go, gosh, how much depth of focus do I need for three animals? Are they both on the same focusing plane? In other words, are they both exactly the same distance from my sensor? Or are they offset? One is closer and one is farther back. If they're on the same plane, then you focus on one, you're focusing on the other. If they're offset and you focus on the one that's in front, the one in back is not going to be in focus unless you use a small enough aperture like f8, f11, f16, and so on, that the one in back is also in focus. Another thing you'll want to do is take photographs of your chosen subject in their environment. And this means to have your animal, but also show where they live. If you're photographing a bird, you show the bird prominent in the frame but maybe also have part of the limb and the flowers on the tree. If you're photographing like a prairie dog, then you have the prairie dog and the mound that he stands next to, and maybe the grass in the background. Or say you're photographing a ground squirrel. You have the ground squirrel in the front, and then you have a bunch of flowers back in the background, a bunch of dandelions that he's eating on and things like that. <laughs> you want to be able to take photographs of your chosen subject, but also show where they live. And the next thing you want to try and get, and this is a hard one, is an animal scape. Now an animal scape is a combination of an animal and a landscape. So you've got the beauty of the landscape in the background, and you've got the animal in the foreground. Now there's a decision to make. Do you have the background in focus or out of focus? Now if you're dealing with a very small animal like a ground squirrel, you may want to put the background a little bit out of focus just in order to draw the eye to the small animal because it's going to get lost in this great big scene of a mountain and a pasture and everything like that. If you've got a large animal, say you have a bison and a mountain in the background, well, the bison is so big in the frame that you can afford to also have the mountains be in sharp focus. So it takes a little bit of thought process. Remember, you are the photographer. You are in charge. It is your picture you're coming home with. Don't let the camera think for you. 
put the camera in manual mode, and you choose the apertures, the shutter speeds, the ISOs, to come home with the pictures that you want to come home with. And if you don't come home with them today, go back tomorrow. Go back the next day. This is an exercise that you do over and over and over again with this common subject. So along with this video, I've shown you a number of pictures that go along with the things that I've told you. Go through the video again and listen carefully to what I'm saying while looking at the pictures to see what I came home with. Because these are the pictures that I thought illustrated the concepts that I was thinking about because this is the way that I photograph any animal. I come home with a portrait, horizontal, vertical. I do an animal in his environment. I do an animal feeding. I do an animal doing some type of action, either running, looking, playing, something like that. I take an image of an animal in their environment. I take a picture of an animal scape, if possible. That's a difficult one, but it's one to always try and get if you can get it. It's always good to also take an, a picture that makes the viewer ask the question, what? What are they looking at? What are they doing? And stuff. And this picture of this black-footed ferret staring off into the distance makes you look at the picture and go, I wonder what he's looking at. So it's that type of thing that you want to think through in your pictures and go, what do I want to come home with? I want my pictures to tell a story. I want my pictures to be sharp. I want the animal to be looking towards the camera. All these are things that I, I tell myself. Sometimes you can get the animal to make an expression that kind of captures the emotions of the viewer. And this is what you're going for. You're going for images that evoke emotions from the people who are viewing them. Evokes emotions from you also because you're a viewer. You're not just a photographer. Well, that's your basic uh, final exam. Go out and shoot these pictures and do this day after day. I've actually taught a course exactly like this, and this was the final exam that my students had to go out and shoot a portrait, an animal scape, images of the animal feeding, images of action of the animal doing things, come home with horizontals and verticals, all of these things was things that my students had to do. Now you get to do this yourself and you get to come back to your computer and study each day to determine, did I come home with what I wanted to come home with? And you'll notice in this video, not once did I talk about the camera brand that you're using, how long of a lens you're using, what any of this cost or anything like that, because all of that is immaterial. What matters is, did you bring home the bacon? Did you come home with the goods? No one really cares other than other photographers and people who know a little bit about cameras, what camera brand you have. What they want to know is, how did you get that image? And it's great to be able to say, well, I sat out there for six days but I had in my mind a picture that I wanted to come home with. And it took that much time, but I'm proud that I came home with it. I hope this video has been good for you. If you would, hit the like icon. If you haven't subscribed to our channel, please go ahead and subscribe now. We put out videos at least once a week, sometimes multiple times a week. We thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you back here again very soon. Goodbye.